All right, well, uh, last time we, uh, we just sort of started in, or, or started in chapter 9, finished up chapter 8, and only went through really a few verses, I think, of, of chapter 9. And tonight, uh, I'm just going to kind of just lay it out there. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read through chapter 9, and I'm going to tell you, probably most of you already know this, especially if you've been reading uh, these chapters, there's a lot of controversy, in, in many ways, particularly in chapter 9, because in chapter 9, we deal with, you know, what's this whole matter of Israel? You know, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Uh, what's this whole matter of election? And uh, what does that mean about Calvinism, for those of you who know what Calvinism is? What does that mean? Because, because that tends to be Calvinists' favorite, um, favorite passage. Um, I, I just need to ask a question, and, and please don't be embarrassed. Just raise your hand, okay? Who feels reasonably comfortable when I say Calvinism? Reasonably comfortable in understanding, in, 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 it's not a test, I just want to know, so I have a sense of where I'm going here. Uh, some, have some reasonable sense, just basic sense, of what Calvinism is. If I say tulip, not a flower, can you, you know what I'm talking about. All right, so let's, let's review, that's good. Um, but but I, I want to keep it on as much of a general level, so we, I don't want to go too deep into the weeds on this stuff, because we'll do that another time, But because um, I think there's a place for this. Uh, Calvinism, and don't worry, we're getting into chapter 9. We're really going to talk about Israel. But, but because Calvinists love this passage, they love to come to this passage, it's important we get it. Um, Calvinism, it's an ism. It's, it's a theology of man. It's purported to be rooted in the word of God, but it's a theology of man. Calvinism, hence Calvin, John Calvin, 16th century, okay? So, um, so the TULIP is, is used as an acronym to represent uh, the, the five basic points. Some people are actually what are called seven-point Calvinists. We're not even going to deal with that tonight. Just five-point Calvinism is the classic approach, T-U-L-I-P. It's an acronym. Um, T stands for Total depravity. Before you knew Christ, you were totally depraved, even to the point you were dead. Dead. Not in the flesh, but dead. You, unconditional election. Without any condition, God chose you, drew him to, to himself. L, limited atonement. Hmm. A Christ shed his blood only for the church. Christ shed his blood only for those who are the saved. I, irresistible grace. You can't resist his grace. If he's drawing you, oh no, he le never lets go. Okay? Um, and P, the perseverance of the saints. Basically, it, it, people boil it down to a slogan, which is unfortunate, but uh, once saved, always saved. Okay? Uh, now, there are some problems with that, and this is not the night to go through it all. One, I will say, is that just so you understand the basics of it, because you're, the, the, as goes the theology. This is not what I believe. I'm just saying, as goes the theology. If you're totally depraved, that means you, there's nothing of any value that any of us could ever bring to the throne of grace, which is pretty obvious, right? Just looking at you, I can tell that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but that we're dead, right, before we come to Christ. So... So the idea in Calvinism is that God actually begins the work in drawing you to himself. Now, that's actually biblical and on that level, right? Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father first draws. But the idea here is, if you actually start to read through the books, is that God has to awaken you so that you begin to know him. In, other, in essence, you become born again before you're actually consciously born again. Now, that's problematic, but we'll just leave that for now. Um, the, the idea of uh, unconditional election, okay, it's without, it's without any conditions. There's nothing we bring to it. Like, okay, I get that. Limited atonement, that, that troubles me every time I just say the phrase. You know, and there's a number of verses I can think of. The one that always comes to mind is uh, 1 John 2, 1, that, uh, that Christ is the propitiation. He's the satisfaction of the wrath of God. For He's the propitiation for our sins. That's the church. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the, what? Whole world. So there's a trouble there. Okay. Irresistible grace. Um, I know people who resist his grace. But of course, in the, in the Calvinistic logic, they don't count. I'm not being mean by saying that. I'm just saying that as the logic flows. Uh, so anyhow, 
we can, we can work through some of that. Why are you bringing this up? Because as we get into chapter 9, we're going to be looking at things like where, where, where Paul's talking about how God hardened Pharaoh's hearts, or, or Jacob I loved, Esau I've hated, things like that. Tonight is not the night that I'm going to walk through that. I'm just telling you up front, so don't think I'm cheating. Don't think, you know, he, he, he just doesn't have it in him tonight. He just doesn't want to handle those things. No, we're handling that another night. We're going to, I'm just going to read through the, the passage, okay, the, the chapter, chapter 9. Remember, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. Paul has just gone, gone through his definitive, um, uh, uh, um, I, I get his, his definitive writing of, of the essential Christian doctrine, right? And he comes to the end of chapter 8, saying there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, so there's, no, um, there's no separation. Nothing could ever separate us from the love of, Christ, love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's just this great cathedral of the faith right there at the end, or in, in chapter 8, in the middle of this book. And then he gets into chapter 9, a lot of people think, what happened? Did, you know, did your brain misfire? What, what happened, Paul? Because now he starts talking about something entirely different than anything he's discussed up to that point. And what he's really doing, he's addressing what he presumes to be the logical question that comes from his reader. Remember, most of, or many of his readers, you know, the predominance of his readers probably, were Jews in Rome at that point, Jewish Christians. So he's answering the question that he presumes to be asked, which is, well then, what about Israel? Israel was still in, in Israel. I mean, the, the people were still in Israel. Uh, the temple still stood. This is not, 70 AD has not occurred yet. This is in the, uh, the mid to late 50s. Um, but clearly, there's a problem because Israel has rejected her Messiah. And Paul is going to answer chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, that God is not done with Israel. Chapter 9, generally speaking, chapter 9 speaks to Israel's past, Chapter 10 speaks to Israel's present, particularly at that time, but also today. And chapter 11 speaks, all, all the more is more present for us, but to Israel's future. Okay, So that's kind of how you divide them out. All right, so Paul says this. Let me just read it. And then we'll go into something a little different than you might have expected. I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and con continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ himself came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. But it's not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But the scripture says, in Isaac, your seed will be reckoned. That is, those who are of the children, who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise as are counted as the seed. For this is the word of the promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah shall have a son, speaking to the, right, the, the son of the promise. Remember, there, there were many who descended from Abraham. Ishmael descended from Abraham. Just to say I'm a descendant of Abraham doesn't make one, you know, a, one of God's chosen ones, okay? Because he promised one, Isaac, who was coming. But because uh, Abraham and Sarah wanted to be God's little helpers, right, then we have the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, right, um, who, is, who is Ishmael. And at the same time, if you go into chapter 25 of Genesis, there are, I just want to say six, maybe there's five, but anyhow, descendants of Abraham through his third wife, Keturah. So all who are of Abraham are not the ones God's talking about because he said, through Isaac, your seed will be reckoned, right? The promise flows from Abraham through Isaac through Jacob. Okay, so I'm just kind of making a few points as we go. All right, so, and not only this, verse 10, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, not having done any good or any evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, there we go, the big words, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it's written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. But what shall we say then? Is, is there unrighteousness with God? I mean, because that's what it seems like, right? Absolutely not, certainly not. 
he says. For he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and on whom he wills, he hardens. You'll say to me then, well, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? I love the response. But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Now, there's a good question, by the way, because we all get our little fairness hats on. So be careful if the questions we want to ask God. So, you know, I'll get to heaven. I got a question. You probably won't be asking it. You're going to know what you need to know. Doesn't the potter have the power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and the other for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared be beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles? As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, speaking to, of the Gentiles, really, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, that they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as uh, the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved, for he will finish the work and he will cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord... Uh, Sabaoth, not Lord of Sabaoth, Lord Sabaoth, had, the Lord of hosts, had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. What then shall we say? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, then, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained the law of righteousness. Why? because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it's written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now, there's some things in there that resonate with you, some things in there that maybe you've read it a hundred times and it still troubles you when you read it. We'll try to work through this over a couple of weeks. But tonight, there, there are two issues, and one we're not going to go into any more than I already did, you know, Calvinism. We can touch on that another time, which I think will be very much worth our while. But uh, if, we're, if you're aware, I hope you are, um, this week uh, has been, actually it was uh, yesterday, or two days ago, I believe, was the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz in 45. Um, this matter of what happened in the Holocaust, how did this happen? How did this come about that six million would be targeted by the Nazi regime for extermination? Um, I, I, I've told some of you the story before very quickly. You know, I, I, my, my dad is German and uh, immigrated here in, well, he was born in 21, immigrated in 25, I guess it was. He was four years old. Um, his, uh, his father was already here, and so mom brought the kids over a year later. That's how it works with immigration at that time, especially. And um, it's a long, sordid story. But the bottom line, growing up, you know, uh, not knowing anything about the Weimar Republic and, and, and all that, um, let me just say real quick, the Weimar Republic, some people know very well what that was all about, but others have no clue. So, so the Weimar Republic preceded the National Socialist Party, the Nazi regime, when Hitler becomes the Chancellor of Germany and all that. And so in the Weimar Republic, if you go back and think of World War I, what, what, what the Germans did in World War I and the destruction that they wrought throughout Western Europe was hellacious. And so the League of Nations required that the, Ger that the German nation pay what was called reparations to England, to France, and a few others, but, but to some major European countries because of, because of all that they destroyed in, in Europe. And so, uh, so Germany, you know, they kind of had to do it, right? So they, they began to do it. Well, they, they did it the easiest way they could. They printed more Deutschmarks. 
And the more Deutsche marks you print, that satisfies for a little while, but it creates in, in, you know, huge inflation. Any inflation that any of us have seen in our lifetime in the United States is nothing compared to this. And to put it in perspective, this is my economics hat on here, but to put that in perspective, think of your house, if you own a house, and what you paid for that house. The amount of money that you paid for that house prior to the inflation, it's called trillion, T-R, trillion-fold inflation. The amount of money you paid for that house at the beginning, just before that, uh, that inflation began, barely would buy you a loaf of bread at the height. Can you put that in perspective? Okay. And so, so as they did that, of course, it, it destroyed, uh, it, there was no value in the reparations, but of course, now they destroyed their own economy. Hitler rises on the scene, right? Hitler rises on the scene and he says, we didn't finish what we began in the First World War, and quite frankly, that's how uh, most Germans felt. We, we, our, 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 our mission was cut short. And so many people resonated with that. There's a lot more to this than that. But, um, so my, my grandfather came over in 24. My father comes over in 25. I grow up in a family now of an immigrant, you know, dad. And, um, and of course, the stories in our house were always, you know, grandpa was in the black market. There was other sort of stories about my grandfather, too. But anyhow, there, that, uh, he was in the black market. And so for all of us, it was like, ooh, the black market. You know, of course, once I understood trillion-fold inflation, like, well, duh, everybody being in the black market, you do whatever you could just to find food for your family, right? And so that's why he fled from Germany to come over to, um, to the States to try to make a, a life for himself and for his family. Um, and so after, after uh, Pearl Harbor, my dad and my uncle, you know, my dad and his brother, uh, enlisted in the Army Air Corps, and they ended up in the European theater. It wasn't until the early 60s, I forget now if it was 63 or what, but until my grandfather actually spoke to my dad. He was so, and probably my uncle too, but, um, uh, but he was so angry that his sons would actually betray him and go against the fatherland. Okay, so I, I bring that up just so you have some sense of there, that there's one German immigrant family's you know, perspective. Um, and, 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 and my grandfather was convinced that Adolf Hitler was doing the very best for Germany. And of course, this whole idea of the Jews was no big deal to him because everybody knows, as far as he's concerned, they're the problem, the basic problem anyhow. Well, how does that come about? That's really the question that you have to ask. Is, you know, um, racism, prejudice in general, racism is a, is, is, a, is a sick, sick sin. It's an evil. And and anti-Semitic racism, because that's what it is, is just as sick, particularly sicker, when we understand who we're talking about, who the, who the object of, of, that, of that anger is. So I always walked around with this thing and very interested because I like politics and social things and economics and all that stuff in history. And, um, and as a Christian then, you know, I've always had a real heart, you know that, I, I say that a lot, I've had a heart for Jewish people and all. Um, but when it comes to anti-Semitism, never think of myself as anti-Semitic. One of the first times I walked through Yad Vashem, some of you have been there before, Yad Vashem is the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. And one of the first displays you see as you walk in to Yad Vashem is a basic, you know, big, big display about Nazism, swastikas, all that. Um, and then there's a, a placard there that I don't have the exact quote on, but basically what it says is that from its very inception, the Christian church was against Israel. From its very inception, the church was anti-Semitic. I took, frankly, I, I took issue with that. Like, wait a minute. No, no, that's something that was added in later on. And um, I, I've touched on a couple of these things before. I'll just, write, uh, I'll just read you one thing right now. You don't have to turn there. You can take notes if you like. But uh, Third John, you're probably familiar that John writes to, um, uh, he, he, he writes to, is it Demetrius? But, but he writes to one, and he refers to someone at that church called Diotrephes. By the way, Diotrephes, in, in the old days, uh, in the first century, when people were saved, you know, Gentiles, right? They're, Gentiles are, are um, uh, they're pagans, and they're idol worshipers. So when they were saved, they came to Christ, they would take their names, which very often were names that, um, uh, that referenced uh, the, you know, like the Greek gods and things like that. They would change their names to Christian names. Well, Diotrephes has not been changed. 
And Diotrephes has position in this church. You read it for yourself, I'll just explain it to you now. But he has position in that church. And his name means nourished by Zeus. So he's never changed his name. He's sticking to who he is. And, and John says there, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, he's the big chiefs, he does not receive us. Who's us? See, if you want to just think they're us as Christians, uh, why is he in the church? Who's us? John and his Jewish brethren. Diotrephes does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren. Who? The Jewish brethren. And he forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Wow. So anti-Semitism, we think of something as something that happens later than the church. This is before the end of the first century that John's writing this. And, and you can find other, you know, sometime, you know, go through Matthew 25 where Jesus talks about, and we're all pretty familiar with this, about the end of the, the, um, the tribulation period, and the Lord will come, and as a shepherd, he will, he will gather the, the sheep and the goats, and he will separate the sheep from the goats, the sheep to his right and the goats to his left. And to the sheep on his right, he'll say, you know, uh, you saw me when I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. Uh, I was naked, you gave me clothing. And, and when I was in prison, you visited me. Um, and they'll say, when did, you know, when did we see you naked and all these things? And, you know, if you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. But to the goats, he'll say, I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me drink. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was in prison, you never visited me. When did we see this? You must be mistaken. Let's get, you know, start over. Um, and they'll say, if you did it not to the least of these, my brethren. The question is, who's my brethren? See, most Christian teaching takes that and generalizes it as be kind and compassionate to people. Be charitable. And that's right. But is that what Jesus is saying? He's saying in the tribulation period, There'll be a big division that has to do with how people treated Israel. I'm, I'm not sticking on that. I'm just giving you samples to be, to be chewing on. Okay, so, uh, so here, as we walk through this, I want to go through something. Um, uh, many of us have, some, uh, have no idea at all, maybe. Um, I know there's an on switch. There's the on switch. Um, here's, no, not him. Where's John? Come on, John. What happened to John Stott? No? All right. Well, John Stott was supposed to be up there, but he couldn't show up today. He died in 2011. Um, and he has a few things to say. But what he basically says is that the true Jews today's, today are Christians. The true Jews today are Christians. This is a modern theologian. Yeah, he's with the Lord now. But, uh, and, and by the way, when, when I mention some of these people, that does not mean I'm, I'm questioning their Christian faith. Calvin, one thing I certainly agree with John Calvin, is that well, one of his favorite quotes, and I love to use it with my Calvinist friends, he said, surely no one can be more than 80% certain in their theology. Well, if you've got a five-point theology, at least one of them's wrong. <laughs> right? so, um, and, and so I'm not questioning, because we can all be wrong theologically about some things, but there are certain things that God looks <laughs> not at all favorably upon. Right? And here's John Stott, uh, I mean, uh, uh, someone we look to in many ways. Many of us have read many of the things that Stott has read. Uh, a friend of Billy Graham and many, you know, people. Um, the true Jews today, he says, are Christians. And I hope that you have a problem with that statement. Um, because I know lots of Jews today who are certainly not Christians, and they are Jewish. Um, now, Martin, um, in, in his, uh, he wrote... One of the books, you, now look, Martin Luther, there's a lot of great things that Martin Luther did. Let's face it. I mean, we talk about the Reformation, you know, the 95 Theses on the church door in Wittenberg. Uh, you know, I mean, great things that Martin Luther did. Don't misunderstand that. But as his life rolled on, he became increasingly embittered with the Jews. He wrote uh, in his book, Heresies of the Jews, um, some of these things. He called them an accursed people, consummate liars, boastful, arrogant, rascals, vilest whores and rogues, murderers, venomous serpents, the devil's children, a plague, a pestilence, a sheer misfortune for our country. Um, and he called upon the, the German princes to burn down their synagogues and to exile them. 
anybody can have a bad day, I suppose, but um, <laughs> I don't really make, mean to make as much light of it as that sounded, but um, here's what God says in Jeremiah. Let me read this, Jeremiah 33, beginning in verse 24. Have you not considered what these people have spoken, saying the two families which the Lord has chosen, he's also cast them off? Thus they've despised my people as if they should no more be a nation before them. Thus says the Lord, if my covenant is not with the day and the night, and if I have not appointed the ordinance of heaven and earth, then I'll cast away the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, so that I will not take any of his descendants to be rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will cause their captives to return and will have mercy on them. What's God saying? <laughs> Can I let go of heaven and, uh, heaven and earth? Can I let go of day and night? I'm in control of all that. I'm in control of that. I'm faithful in all these things. I'm also faithful in terms of my promises to my people Israel. That's what he's saying. And, and God emphasizes his faithfulness to Israel. He does it here. Um, we see it throughout the scripture. There are some, God has made some unconditional promises to Israel. His faithfulness to them will last forever. They will be his people forever. The land covenant that he made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, it's, it's unconditional, okay? And he even says, there are going to be times that you're going to worship idols, and I'm going to kick you out of here. And this is what the nations are going to say about you, but I will bring you back. Isaiah even says in chapter 11, when the Lord brings Israel back the second time, the first time he brought them back was after the Babylonian captivity, and the second time he brought them back has been after the great diaspora, beginning around 1897, and especially we see it in 1948, and it continues on today, even last year. In the midst of all the trouble going on around the world and in Israel, there were over 10,000 people, 10,000 Jews from around the world who made aliyah, aliyahs, like immigration, to go back to Israel because Israel established a law early on in, in, in their statehood called the Law of Return so that anybody who had Jewish blood, uh, I have Jewish blood, but I don't count. Uh, I have 20% Jewish blood according to the, the DNA test I took, but I'm a pastor, I'm a goy, I'm a, so I really don't count. Um, but... But anybody who can, can prove their, their, Jew, their, their Jewishness has the right of return, the right to have dual citizenship, actually. Um, so anyhow, um, so God's emphasizing his faithfulness to Israel, like even in that statement, in many other places in Scripture that we can see that. So there's this heretical doctrine of demons, and there's no other way to put it as far as I'm concerned. Right? I mean, Paul even says, in the last days people will, will depart from the faith you know, giving heed to doctrines of demons. This is one of them. It's a doctrine of demons to say that the Jewish people are no longer God and that, and that God, in his purposes, has rejected them. Because people say, those who are, and the, and the, and the correct phrase for this group of people who believe this, and it's not a small group of people, by the way, it's the majority of those who call themselves Christians, whether they realize they are or not, are in churches that are called replacement theology churches that believe that the church has replaced Israel in terms of God's plans. And some of this, for you, some of you, this may seem like dry, dusty, heady stuff. And I see how it is. But it's critical to understanding actually what's happening in the world today and why the world believes the way it does about Israel. And so those who are replacement theologians believe what they believe because Israel rejected her Messiah, Jesus Christ. That's really what it comes down to. And the people who have been steering this juggernaut, this replacement theology juggernaut throughout the centuries, um, laid the foundation, who laid the foundation for this heresy are called the church fathers. Okay? By the way, I, many times I, I've come across people and, you know, who, who say, let's go back and let's listen to what the church fathers had to say. Let's read what the church fathers have to say. And a lot of times the church fathers have some very good things to say. But just because something's old doesn't make it right. Okay? All you have to do is read Revelation chapters 2 and 3 and read the seven letters from Jesus to the seven, letter, to the seven churches, and you find that five of them are in deep yogurt. They, they got something wrong going on, right? They got something wrong going on before the end of the first century. And two of them, by the way, are, are accused of being members of the synagogue of Satan, right, who believe that they're the Israel of God. That's replacement theology even back um, before the end of the first century. All right, so let's look at a few of these. hope they're up there. Um, one of the first ones, when I say the early church fathers, these are people 
who lived after the apostles. So all the apostles are gone. John's the last one. He dies at the end, at the end of the first century. Okay, so if we look, for example, at Justin Martyr. Uh, Justin Martyr, pretty early on, AD 100, that's assumed, to 65. I know that some of these things are hard to read. So, uh, for the true spiritual Israel and the descendants of Judah, Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, he says, are we, he's a Gentile, the game of Christ, are we who have been led to God through this crucified Christ. Christ is the Israel. So suddenly we've gone to saying a man, the God-man, Jesus Christ, is a, group, a people group, Israel. And the Jacob, even so we, are the true Israelite race. Okay? Um, Justin Martyr, big deal. Canonized by the church, that means he was made a saint. Uh, but the only church that existed in those days, okay, the Catholic church, it wasn't Roman yet, but the Catholic, Catholic means universal. He was canonized later by the Roman Catholic church. He's a saint in the church. Um, Note his use of the, of the term spiritual Israel. I don't know if you have a problem with that, but you'll not find that in your Bible. This is the issue, okay? But, and I just got to say this. Anytime, no matter how much we may like somebody, no matter how, how much we may like their preaching, their teaching, the books they write, the things they say, or the music they play, don't ever put them on the pedestal when Jesus Christ is the one to be there. Follow Jesus Christ. Don't follow anybody, Amen. right? Okay? Um, so spiritual Israel, you're not finding it in the Bible. It's a post-biblical term. Post, it's after the Bible is written and it virtually canonized. Okay, um, here's another one, hopefully. Cy Cyprian, he's the, the bishop of Carthage, 195 to 258. He originated the idea of mother church. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. Mother church. So God is father, church is mother. He's the one who came up with that idea. He's a saint. He said the Jews had departed from God and they lost God's favor while the Christians had succeeded to their place. We replaced them. See what he's saying? Um, see, I could talk about this all day long. It's better to hear what some of the big wigs had to say. Here's another guy, Irenaeus. Oh, that's Tertullian. Well, all right, maybe we'll find him so long, but let's, let's move up to Tertullian. I'll tell you what Irenaeus had to say. Uh, he said that... Um, that Israel was disinherited from the grace of God. Let me say that again, because you don't look surprised. <laughs> disinherited from the grace of God. You're saved by what? Grace. Well, if you're saved by grace and not of yourselves, how could you be disinherited? Grace. It's God's grace, isn't it? So how could Israel be disinherited from the grace of God? I mean, there's, there's a lot of problems with that. You, you can't find that anywhere in your Bible. You're never going to find that concept in the Bible. God loves Israel what? With an everlasting love. By the way, he loves you with an everlasting love too. So if we got a problem with Israel, you've got a problem too. Okay? Because if we're going to say God's a promise breaker, he'll break his promises with you too. That's Allah. Allah is capricious. Sometimes I like you, sometimes I don't. That's capricious. God loves you with an everlasting love, an unconditional, agape love. Okay? Um, all right, let's go to Tertullian. It would be tedious, he says, to state at length how the figurative interpretation of Israel's promised restoration, that's what he's referring to, okay? In other words, this idea that Israel will be restored to the land, he calls it figurative. In other words, it's not real, right? It would be tedious to state at length how the figurative interpretation of Israel's promised restoration is spiritually applicable to Christ and his church and to the character and fruits thereof. In other words, it's, it's figurative, so we can go on at length about this, but he's ignoring the, the truth, right? He's ignoring the reality of it. Let's look at, hopefully, Clement. Clement of Alexandria. He was a big deal, 150 to 215. Alexandria, this is before the, the great library in Alexandria was destroyed by the fire. This is, this is northern Egypt, all right? Right there on the Med. He was the head of what was called the catechetical school of Alexandria. Some people believe it was actually founded by Mark. Um, it's the oldest school of priests and theologians. So this guy was a big cheese. He was educating the priests and the theologians who were going out into the world in those days. This is the, the Princeton Theological Seminary of the day, okay? Or what I call Princeton Semi-Logical. Um, th this is who they were, right? They, this is, this is, and so he's the head, catechetical, as in catechism, right? He, he was the head of the catechetical school. Um, and, and very famous in terms of promoting the allegorical interpretation. 
but there are others, and this is the guy, Origen. He's, they call him allegorizer general. You could call him the father of the allegory. What's an allegory? An allegory is when you take a biblical, in, in biblical terms, when you take a biblical story and you choose to assign meaning to people's names, activities, that you have no basis in Scripture for doing. But there are sometimes you can do that. You can find types of, of things in the Scripture. But when you start using allegory, by the way, allegory is a very popular form of teaching, even in the church today, in what I'd call the mainline churches, the mainline. By the way, this is one of the reasons I don't like the term evangelical, because it used to be the mainline evangelical churches, the liberals. Now we're called the evangelicals. No, 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 no. But well, you can be an evangelical if you want to. Be evangelistic, that's good. But an evangelical is a different topic. Why mince words? Anyhow, so uh, Origen was the father of allegory. Um, he said this. And we say with confidence that they, Israel, will never be restored to their former condition. Remember, they're, they're, Israel's been dispersed to the world at this point. It accordingly behooved that city where Jesus underwent these sufferings, Jerusalem. It accordingly behooved Jerusalem and the invitation of happiness offered them by God to pass to others, the Christians. God doesn't care about Israel anymore. He only cares about Christians. Origen had enormous influence on the early church, and he continues to do that today. But the big daddy, the big, 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 big daddy is, now there's a, there's a city in Florida called August, Augustine. This is Augustine. Okay, that's the difference. It's spelled in the same way, 345, 430. So, so he's there in the 4th to early 5th century, and he's really, like it says here, the patron saint of replacement theology. He says this, and, I, and the reason this is important is this guy has had enormous influence. I mean, this is all the, the, Catholic, the church is already Roman Catholic at this point, okay? And if you, you listen to what Francis or any of the popes have to say about Augustine, he's always quoted. He's had enormous influence on, on the Roman Catholic church. And therefore, we ought to take this saying, and you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. That's where God promises in Ezekiel 36. I'm going to bring you back. You're going to come back to this land. Reread it for yourself tonight. It's very clear what God is saying to Israel. He says, we ought to take that saying that, I, that, that I'll give this land back to you. Not literally, as if they referred to Israel after the flesh, but spiritually referring to, there's that phrase, the spiritual Israel. In other words, it's going to be ours. It's not going to be theirs. Um, Augustine is referred to in the Oxford Dictionary uh, of Christian church, without Augustine's massive intellect and deep spiritual perception, Western theology would never have taken the shape in which it is familiar to us. That's true. Not great, but it's, it, but it's true. Um, here's something for you. 2015, the Vatican formally recognizes the Palestinian state by signing a treaty with them. Um, accepted, the, accepted Islam as, as a legitimate uh, uh, form of worship. I don't know how you feel about that. I know how I do. The Vatican formally recognized Palestinian state by signing the treaty because now, uh, Palestine, and this is important, Palestine is a name that was given to the land of Israel in 130 A.D., it's never been the name of Israel. God didn't give it to him. No one else gave it to him. Um, after Israel rebelled in 70 and Rome destroyed the city, another 65 years goes by. And, um, and, and again, they begin to rebel, and the place was absolutely leveled. And Rome named Jerusalem, Aia Capitolina, in other words, naming it after the pantheon of the Roman gods, and because of how much they hated Israel, they called the land of Israel, Palestinia, after their ancient enemies, the Philistines. Okay, just understand that when you, when you think of Palestine. So it's a name giving it in 130 AD. Okay, here's the Vatican saying we recognize the Palestinian state because they see it as, they, they don't recognize Israel as Israel. Why? because the Roman Catholic Church has been steeped in replacement theology all along. I'm not bashing Catholics, I'm not bashing anyone, I'm just saying this is the historical fact. All right, 
In the early 16th century, this guy comes along, Jean Chauvin. You know him as John Calvin, okay? And, um, and he championed Augustine, uh, Augustine in a very big way. Uh, as Reformation is underway in the 16th century, this new theology is born, we'll get to these guys in a minute, called um, covenant theology. Sounds nice, but it's, it was, this is, this is post-biblical theology. You don't find it in the Bible. Bible verses are used to put it together, but you don't find it in the Bible. Covenant theology. And covenant theology is, first of all, it's rooted in Augustine. Why? Because it comes from the Roman Catholic Church. It's reformed because it's happening during a time where ref Reformation theology is happening. Remember, the Reformation was a rebellion against the Roman Catholic Church. And it's amillennial. Most of us get blurry-eyed when we hear, you know, premillennial, premillennial postmillennial, amillennial. Ah means without. There is no. A, the A means no. Millennium. The Bible promises there will be a 1,000-year kingdom. You read about it clearly in Isaiah chapter 65 and 66. You read about it clearly in the last chapters of, uh, beginning in chapter 20 of Revelation. 1,000-year kingdom where Israel is restored to its greatness. Christ rules from a throne in Jerusalem for 1,000 years. It's clear. I went to a Presbyterian seminary. And, and I know. How, how this thing, I, I sat in eschatology classes. I was amazed by this. some of the things that people would say. We could be so biblical the way we translate everything until we get to chapter 20 of Revelation. It's like, well, a thousand, who knows if it's really a thousand. Like, wait a minute, I thought we were translating like it's literal up to this point. Yeah, but in other words, theology gets in the way of translation. That happens, by the way, it can happen to you too. So be careful. It's easy to point finger at someone else and not realize how blind we really are sometimes. Okay, so... It's amillennial. It rejects the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. It rejects the restoration of Israel. It also says, covenant theology says, Israel is finished. It says there is no rapture of the church. Oh, yeah. And that Jesus isn't coming back to physically restore the kingdom to Israel or to rule and to reign. Amillennial theology says that we're going to be going along a sudden we'll be out of here and we'll be with Christ in heaven. That's what all millennial theology says. That's predominant in really most of the mainline um, the churches today. All of this is the foundation for the Presbyterian church. Actually, the basic sides of the Presbyterian church, Orthodox Presbyterian church, OPC, only perfect church. They think, <laughs> they think that, I didn't say that. Um, by the way, PCA, Covenant Church right down the road. Um, can you say that? I'm just saying they're PCA. That's what they believe. PCUSA, those are the liberals, okay? Um, and others, okay? Uh, Princeton, I, that's why I call it Princeton Semiological. You probably don't know these guys. Some of you might. Charles Hodge, uh, and Charles Hodge, his son, A.A. A. Hodge, and then B.B. Warfield uh, were all presidents of Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, but you probably know some of these other guys better. But one of the things that, that these have in, in common, besides all being presidents at different time at Princeton, um, and by the way, when I say Princeton, that's a big deal. It may not be a big deal to you today, but it was a big deal then. It's still a big deal on that side of the church today. Um, they were all staunch Calvinists, right? You don't come to Christ because someone gives you the gospel and say, oh, hallelujah, I believe. In fact, in many parts of that church, there's no reason to evangelize. You're just going to come to Christ because he leads you. And that's, that's it. That sounds like an overgeneralization. I want to be careful with that. But they were all staunch replacement theologians. Uh, we get to these guys. They're more recent. R.C. Sproul, a Presbyterian, now with the Lord. J.I. Packer, uh, also with the Lord, I believe. And John Piper, Baptist. Presbyterian, Anglican, Baptist. What do they have in, con in, in common? Same thing. They're all Calvinists. They're all replacement theology. Even the Baptist, you bet, there's a lot of them around, uh, and all uh, millennial. Um, now, you know, if, if you think, I want you to think about this, something for a minute. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, some of you know it by heart, but I'll just say it. So Acts chapter 1, this is the last question that the apostles will ever ask Jesus Christ while on earth, right? He's ready to ascend to heaven. They were gathered there. He's there on the Mount of Olives, and they say, Lord, is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus doesn't say, 
Where'd you come up with that idea? <laughs> There's no kingdom. Kingdom, shringdom. We're not doing that. He didn't say that. He said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has established by his own authority. He's saying, it's a good question, wrong timing. It's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has established by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And then he blasted off. Okay? Well, interesting when you read what Calvin has to say about this. Calvin says, this, I want to read this to you because it's a little fuzzy, but Calvin said, there were as many errors as there were words in the apostles' question. Did you hear that? These are apostles filled with the Holy Spirit since the resurrection, right? Since, right? This proved how bad scholars they were under so good a master, and that when he said, you shall receive power, he admonished them of their imbecility. You like that? This is Calvin. This, I'm just saying. Um, in fact, I'm premillennial. I don't know about the rest of you. Now, there's, there's, there's pre-trib. Christ is, is going to receive us out of here, right, before the, seven year, the 70th week of Daniel, seven-year tribulation period. And then there's pre-millennial. That just means Christ is going to return physically, bodily, to earth prior to the 1,000-year kingdom, right? So pre-millennial, post-millennial, like post toasties you have to come afterward, you know, or a millennial. Both of those are crazy. The first one is the one that makes sense biblically, as far as I'm concerned. I'm premillennial, don't know about you, but this is what John Calvin thinks about me. Even a blind man can see what stupid nonsense these people talk. It's when your theology blinds you to what the Bible actually has to say. Now, uh, and by the way, th these are old guys. We're talking about fathers of the church, right? But, you know, in this day and age, there are many, uh, you know, some of you are familiar with what's happened over the years with Hank Hanegraaff. Um, he's, he's a real bad actor. Um, Hank Anagraf is Amil. He's a, he's a hyper-Calvinist. I think he's a seven-pointer now. Um, and, uh, and he's just plain obnoxious to listen to, frankly. I mean, I don't, I don't mind someone having a weird theology, but he's just so arrogant. Um, but he, uh, he and there's a man, probably most of you don't know, Gary Burge. Uh, our daughter, you may know, uh, our youngest daughter went to Wheaton. And I, when she went there, I also had heard about Gary Burge, and I said, do not take any classes with this guy. Gary Burge is the professor of New Testament at Wheaton College. Um, he's replacement theology, um, and very much that. Um, his roots are in, uh, he said, I've been shaped by the Reformed theological tradition. I take my cues from older writers, such as John Calvin, and from theologians who belong to the Reformed tradition, such as Piper, N.T. Wright, and John Stott. Um, you know, R.C. Sproul has a son, R.C. Sproul Jr., and he wrote in Table Talk, we believe that the church is essentially Israel. We believe that the church is essentially Israel. We believe that the answer to what about the Jews is, here we are. Um, some of you might know the name Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Uh, not a real popular name, increasingly popular, I think, on this side of the church. I love the guy. Uh, you know, when you open up a, 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 a systematic theology book or a volume of systematic theology books, there are all these different ologies that, that you read when you go to seminary or on a, on a typical pastor's shelf. There's all these books on, on theology. But Fruchtenbaum made the point right at the beginning, yeah, but there's nothing on Israelology. And that's true. You, you look in any systematic theology book, there's nothing about Israelology. So he wrote a book about that thick called Israelology. He's great stuff. I really like this guy. I'd love to meet him someday. And I liked his quote after, after reading that. He said, um, too bad you weren't espousing that idea on the streets of Berlin in 1941. <laughs> so you can have your theology. But if you're standing in Nazi Germany saying that in 1941, you'd have found yourself transported to Auschwitz or Dachau or Birkenau or, you know, one of these. That's why this is called From Augustine to Auschwitz. How do you get here? How did we get to this place? Because here's the big mistake many people make, I really believe this with all my heart, is to believe that the horror of the Holocaust is way back in the middle of the 20th century. <laughs> I think I referred to it a couple weeks ago, Zechariah chapter 13. He says the next Holocaust is two-thirds of Israel. One-third of Israel died 
in, in the Holocaust, in the Shoah, what it's called in Hebrew, the Shoah, but two-thirds in the next one. There's another one coming because the world hates Israel. You say, I don't hate Israel. Good. But we have to take action. Where did the Nazis get their propaganda that they used against the Jews? Did they, did they invent this out of thin air? No, it came from the church, and especially it came from the Roman Catholic Church. Um, the Jews were blamed for the Black Death. I mean, it's hard to see this, but it, what's happening here is there's a, there's a fountain over there. People are dying. This is the, you know, the Middle Ages. And, um, and people are dying because the Jews, the Jews did it. Um, there's a picture here of Jews be, uh, pouring poison down into the well so that all the non-Jews in Europe would die. The reality is, if you really study it, the Jews in Europe were following the Mosaic law and, and you know, the, 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 the personal uh, cleanliness laws, all those things, it kept them clean. They washed their hands all the time. People weren't doing that in Europe, so people were dying. Um, so, you know, you have this, but there's, it, it gets worse, actually. Um, there's this whole idea of blood libel. You may be familiar with it. Maybe you've heard about it before. What you see here is what, this is, this is how the story goes. It went around Europe for many, 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 many centuries. And don't think it stopped. It's still being told by Arab Christians on college campuses all around the United States today. If you don't believe me, you go check it out for yourself. What's, what is it? It's called a blood libel. And the idea is that the Jews around Passover kidnap Christian children and, and take their blood and use it in the making of matzah. Okay? Now, that's just artwork. You have, you have paintings, you have tapestries, but you also have it on churches. Here, here are sculptures on churches. Same thing's happening right there. It's, it's really pretty horrible stuff. And there, there's all sorts of things. I wasn't going to bore you with all that. This is if, if you are offended easily, please close your eyes. I want to show you something. <laughs> oh, go. Yeah. No, I'm saying if you're offended easily, be careful, okay? Because this is a sow being suckled by Jews, and here's a man about to eat from the end of that sow. Where would we find that? Now, would we think Germany? Maybe so. You'd be safe in saying that. How about Wittenberg and Martin Luther's church? See, these aren't just stories. It's really there. Where do the Nazis get this from? It was already there. It's hard to get more offensive. We could, but I wouldn't do that to you. Um, you know, Thomas Cranmer was the Archbishop of, of uh, Canterbury, and he was the one who really promoted the Book of Common Prayer. At this point, the Book of Common Prayer has 360 million copies that's been printed over the years. And you know, you go back into the, the early days uh, in Europe, in the Middle Ages, um, the uh, church attendance was mandatory. It was the law, right? You had to go. To, it was the law. You had to go to church. And so everybody would read. You didn't just, you know, when we pray, we just pray spontaneously. We don't, we don't pray. I don't pray from notes. Um, and um, some do, but, you know, we don't around here. And, uh, but, but when you're in the Anglican church, you know, you do that, okay? You read, from, you read your prayers from the Book of Common Prayer. You sing your hymns from there, Okay. Uh, and so uh, here's an example of something from the Book of Common Prayer. Merciful God, have mercy upon all Jews, Turks, infidels, and heretics, that they may be saved among the remnant of the true Israelites. Who are we referring to? Us, the Gentile Christians. You have to be careful about the study Bible you use. See, because uh, I could go back and show you things in the Geneva Bible. That's the Bible that the pilgrims used, right, when, when they came over. It wasn't the King James. They were using the, the Geneva Bible. And it's not a bad translation. It was actually the first uh, translation that actually had editor's notes in it that told you how to interpret this verse and what to do with it. And sometimes, some of your Bibles may even still have some remnants of these things that will say, like, for example, in Isaiah uh, 33 or Isaiah 66, that refer to the church, when it's not about the church, it's about Israel. Those are holdovers from, you know, this old idea of replacement theology. It's an old idea, but it's still very contemporary. For that matter, and I just got to say this, you know, many of us have maps in the back of our Bibles. If you look at the maps in the back of your Bible later on when you go home, make a correction if you need to, because I, I love my Holy Scholy, my Schofield Bible. I love it, I love it, I love it. It's a great Bible. But the maps, come on. It says Palestine in the, life, in the time of Christ. There was no Palestine in the time of Christ. 
He's resurrected in 32 AD. It's 130 AD when, when Israel is named Palestine. So take your magic marker and cross out Palestine and write Israel. Um, but anyhow, so you have to be careful about these things. By the way, I got nothing against John MacArthur. I think John MacArthur is a great scholar, but he's also a hyper-Calvinist. And so even some of the things you might find in your MacArthur study Bible, if you have one, will have remnants of some of these ideas. You just have to either be able to know how to chew this, you know, eat the chicken and spit out the bones, or just totally ignore what you're reading. And if you can, if it troubles you, get rid of it. Um, here, you know, I got no problem. I love this. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east to the west, making a very large valley. I know that's going to happen. It's going to happen very soon. The Geneva Bible interprets that by saying, out of all the parts of the world, they shall see Jerusalem, which was before hid with this mountain. And, hid, and this, he means the spiritual Jerusalem, the church. Like, you know, the old hippie in me wants to say, what are you smoking? Okay, but 2012, 14 rather, 2014, Presbyterian Church USA considered banning the word Israel from prayers. They actually went ahead with it. That was considered. They actually went ahead with it. Uh, why? Because they don't want Christians to believe there's any connection between present-day Israel and ancient Israel. Uh, in 2010, a major movement began. It still continues today called BDS. Those three letters were BDS, boycott divestment, sanctions. Anything that comes out of Israel, don't purchase it. If it's a product of Israel, don't purchase it, they say. If it's a product of Israel, I'm going to purchase it just because of that, Amen. right? Um, you know, divest from the don't, don't uh, I'd say invest. You'll, be, you'll probably get richer quicker if you invest, and not because of spiritual things, but because they're so smart, um, and sanctions. They believe that. Um, this is classic. Many mainline uh, uh, churches go along with this. Boycott apartheid Israel. There's nothing apartheid about Israel. I don't have time to get into that one. 2012, the PCUSA and the PCA, I might add, voted to support BDS. Later on that year, the Methodist Church also voted to support youth, uh, uh, BDS. 2013, the United Church of Canada did so. United 15, United Church of Christ did so. Uh, I love this guy. He's one of my favorite commentators, J.C. Ryle. He says, there's one thing which is even worse than controversy, and that's false doctrine that's tolerated, allowed, and permitted. Tolerated, allowed, and permitted without protest. He's a great guy. You know, I, I always thought the best thing that came out of Liverpool was the Beatles. It was actually him. He came out of Liverpool before any one of them. And, and what, what's he saying here? You see, we like to let controversies go by. We don't like to make waves. We actually think it's non-Christian. We think it's non-Christian not to raise a stink and say, wait a minute, where did you get that from? How can you, show me how you found that in the Bible. I don't see that in my Bible. Do I have the wrong one? <laughs> Why not do that? Ask good questions. He's saying it's right to face the controversy. Don't just tolerate something that's wrong, but yet it happens all the time. Um, Here's an example of how Christians can keep wrong things from happening. This was in um, 2000 and I want to say 15. Uh, Christian Palestinianists were unable to establish a beachhead within the Calvary Chapel movement. This happened, I think it was 2015. Um, people like um, Lynn Hybels, Bill Hybels, if you know who Bill Hybels is, um, that his wife, um, World Vision, people love World Vision, it's a humanitarian organization. They are staunchly replacement theology, staunchly anti-Israel, staunchly pro-BDS. Um, and they sought to, uh, to establish this Christian Palestinianist idea beginning in uh, Calvary Chapel, North Coast. It's actually Jack Hibbs, if you know Jack, I, I, I'm a big fan of Jack Hibbs. But he stepped in and he alerted the rest of the Calvary Chapel movement, something, is, something stinks here. Um, so the point is, you have to face these things. You know, Jude says that we're to, uh, we're, we're to stand up. He says in, in Jude 3, he says we're to contend earnestly for the faith. Here's what J.C. Ryle says. There are times when controversy is not only a duty, but it's a benefit. Give me the mighty thunderstorm rather than the, what? The pestilential malaria. One walks in darkness and poisons us in silence and we're never safe. 
The other frightens and alarms us for a little season, but it's soon over, and it clears the air. It's a plain scriptural duty to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. It's our job. Look, if we tolerate it, it's just the mosquito who keeps silently stinging you and putting poison into your body, we have to, into our hearts, into our minds, into our understanding even of who Christ is. We have to face these things. You know, um, the enemy is using all kinds of fine-sounding issues. You know, Paul says, and I, I just love this, I'm just going to read this one verse, but he says to the Ephesian elders before he heads back to Jerusalem, I'm never going to see you again. I've wept for you. I've prayed for you. I've been with you. He says, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he's purchased with his own blood. He's saying, do this. But then he warns them, after I leave you, wolves will come in. Even from your own number they will arise. Can I just tell you, we've seen that happen over the last 20 years. I've seen wolves arise here, and we had to deal with them. And, and you know, I, I often don't make a big deal of it, from the pulpit. I, I have a kind of policy that I, I respond to things publicly as far as something public has become. You know, but otherwise I don't, you know, I can make a, the problem a lot worse otherwise. But um, we've had to deal with things sometimes. People wonder, gee, what's going on? And I'll be happy to explain those things sometimes to somebody, but he's saying that's, that's it's a major issue, be alert. And that's exactly, by the way, what happens to the church in Ephesus. This is a picture of Yad Vashem, in Jerusalem, it's, um, Yad Vashem means a monument in name, and it's a memorial to the six million Jews who replacement theology says, or many say, um, were not exterminated in the Shoah. Not, not, all, not all replacement theology people, but there are many Christians nowadays. Many people think it's only Muslims who say this. No, 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 it's many Christians who say there was no Holocaust. It's really sad, and I mean, not just, it's just a denial of history on the surface. But they were. They were exterminated for one reason. They were Jewish. They were Jewish. They were Jewish. And don't make any mistake, that's happening already. Not extermination, but targeting, persecution, and they're fleeing to the land of Israel right now. And that's not going to decline. Don't make any mistake. What happened yesterday, great stuff in some ways. I still haven't really analyzed it all. But, yeah, it, it sounds great, the deal of the century. I don't know. I don't know. It, this is man's stuff. This is not God's stuff. This is man's stuff. Let's not confuse our, our, our political friends with God's, God's plan. But the Bible tells us that the Jews from all over the world will flee to the land of Israel. And it may be tiny, but don't make any mistake, it can hold a lot of people. One of the weirdest guys in scripture, okay, is Balaam, who was hired by Balak of Moab to curse the Israelites. He says something very interesting. Numbers chapter 23, he says this, and I love what he says here. He says, God is not a man, God is not a man that he should lie, or is he a son of man that he should repent? Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? This is Balaam, real kook. But he's right on here. Behold, I received, Balaam says, I received a command to bless. God has blessed. And I cannot revoke it. The Lord their God, listen to this. The Lord their God is with them and the shout of a king is among them. Isn't that cool? The shout of a king is among them. You go to Israel today, it's a pretty cool place. But is the shout of a king among them? Well, it sounds like a whisper right now, but soon he's going to be in their midst, you know. Um, this is what we read in Jeremiah. I'll close with this. Jeremiah chapter 31, chapter 31, verses 10 through 11, one of my favorite passages. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles afar of off, and say, he who scattered Israel will gather him. See, God's faithfulness. He scattered through punishment. He'll gather because of his faithfulness. And he will keep him as a shepherd does his flock, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob and has ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. Yeah. There's a lot here, and, and I'm, I won't take you through this anymore. I apologize for going late. But, 
you know, it's important that we understand. This is something I like to go through, but can only do in abbreviated form when we go to Israel, and before we go into Yad Vashem, to actually go through, how did we get here? Augustine to Auschwitz. Don't make any mistake. We call it doctrines of demons. It is, but it's Christian doctrines of demons. Not biblical. It's Christian doctrines of demons. And that's how people just swallow it. We, we just take it down, you know, uh, and, and, and hook, line, and sinker. We just take it because someone, you know, who stands in a box says, this is the word of the Lord. No, we're to be Bereans. Don't believe the things I tell you. Search the scriptures, see if those things be true. Because God will not hold us guiltless who stand against his people Israel. The scripture makes that very clear. Let's stand together.